Okay, so our topic is on behavioral ecology. So these, uh, this major topic is subdivided on how or what are the behavior of animals or organisms per se towards their environment, how they reproduce, how they acquire their food, how they choose or select their mate for reproduction, and other more um, behaviors which are related or are product of what we so call natural selection. So, studying the behaviors, most probably humans do study behavior of the organism um, from the past, um, from the past type of or way of living uh, as human evolved um, from their ancestor towards the modern time on how we observed animals in the wild. So humans have probably studied animal behavior um, from the time that human exists on earth, okay? And humans are also considered hunters, so they have already knowledge or they observed how do animals behave, where they can be found, especially for those times that humans are very dependent on animals or other organisms for survival, especially for food. So that originates how humans study behavior. So with that, we have successfully covered or explored or discovered some of the behaviors or unique behaviors of the animals that are or that can be explained on how they adapt to their existing environment. So for example, animals, or we have explored already how animals um, display or their form of display in terms of courtship, in terms of um, how they get their partner or their mate, how they um, how they actually the process of courtship, on how the start of reproduction, on how they care for their young, how they take care for their offsprings, and of course, how they co-evolve with other organisms. Okay, so how in this case, in this figure, for example, there is a co-evolution of a specific a species of plant with a specific uh, type of wasp. Uh, how they co-evolve in terms of this particular insect as their pollinator and the plant itself as its uh, site for reproduction and perpetuation of this particular species. So uh, all of these uh, behavioral um, aspects of different forms of animals both in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems were possible it is because of the observations or different works of humans on behavioral ecology. With that, um, let's define first what is behavior. So behavior is what an animal does and how it does it. So ano yung ginagawa mismo ng animal towards how they acquire food, um, um, paano sila namimili ng kanilang partner, how they reproduce. Okay, so what are the different stages of how they do it is actually part of their behavior, the study of behavioral ecology. So it includes various activities. It is because in some animals, they conduct uh, different stages of, of activities and how they can actually um, perform uh, necessary um, activities that is needed for their growth and development and of course for their survival. So how about learning? So it is considered as a behavioral process. So during the course of evolution or development of a specific behavior, um, there are there is a learning process in that. So this particular learning process has been passed on from one generation to another generation. This is why um, learning as a behavioral process is actually the link between be the study of behavioral ecology and the study of natural selection and of course the study of evolution. Okay, so in terms of behavioral ecology or behavior, there are two causes um, 
of behavior that has been established. The first one is the proximate cause. So these are causes that focus on the immediate stimulus and mechanisms of the behavior which are related first to hered heredity or hereditary, development or developmental, structural, cognitive, psychological, and psychosocial as part of a particular behavior. As you can see, for this particular behavior, young geese follow an, Im an imprint on their mother. So for the proximate cause of that particular behavior, so during an early and critical developmental stage of young geese, observe their mother moving away from them and calling them. So those are the, the particular cause that actually where this particular behavior emerged. And with this behavior, meron din tayong tinatawag na ultimate cause. So what are these? So those are that are explored how the behavior contributes to the sur survival and reproduction. So these are uh, most likely part of what we so called evolutionary or historical origins and selective process that have shaped their past and the current functions. So they have recognized that those um, offsprings or young so that they're not able to, to follow their mother to respond to their call um, most likely do not survive. This because when they are left behind within the flock, so there is a higher tendency that it is um, being eaten by other animals or there is what we so called predation or um, mawawala siya dun sa group, mali left behind siya. So, more or less, it will not survive kasi nga, medyo bata pa siya. So, that is what we so called ultimate cause. So, for this, you have, on average, geese that follow an imprint on their mother receive more care and learn necessary skills and thus have greater chance of surviving than those that do not follow their mother. So, Aside from uh, being left behind by the group, so there are skills that they do not develop it if they do not follow um, such process or such particular behavior. So as you can see, the delineation between proximate cause and ultimate cause runs from different cases or different studies. Okay, so as, as what I have mentioned, you have proximate cause, which is more of hereditary and other aspects. And this ultimate cause is actually on the evolutionary and historical processes. So there is a particular term called ethology. So ethology is a scientific study of animal behavior, particularly in natural environments. Mm, in this particular topic, most of the examples are actually um, centered with animals, but I have inserted some of the behaviors of plants um, that can be a best example for for the other subtopics. Okay, so particularly in the natural environment, of the natural. So you have what we so called fixed action pattern. This is a sequence of unlearned innate behaviors that is unchangeable. Okay, so that is part of the physiology of the animal already. Okay, so uh, a physiological process, okay, which can be seen primarily in the phenotype, okay, physiological and phenotype. So part of its behavior already, which is triggered primarily by sensory stimulus and of course the stimulus coming from the environment. Okay. So in ethology also, this is what we saw called imprinting. So it is a type of behavior that includes both learning and innate component and is generally irreversible. So imprinting is most likely um, being applied or commonly applied to birds, especially for endangered species like of the Philippine eagle. Okay, so ginagamit yung process of imprinting. So gumagamit sila ng isang parang a mother figure yan na uh, will help the young 
to, to eat, especially for endangered animals. So, nagkakaroon sila ng imprinting process on this one that this particular object gives the young or provides the young its own food. So, it is a limited phase of animal's development that is the only time when a certain behaviors can be learned. Okay? So, most probably, imprinting happens when the offspring or the, the species is still on its younger age. Okay? Kasi imprinting does not um, or imprinting cannot be implied at a um, adult age or, or later age, kumbaga. So, imprinting is very important, especially for conservation biology. It is because um, there are certain certain um, species that uh, needs more care than the others. So, conservation biologists have taken the advantage of imprinting, especially for taking care of young animals, Ayan, especially for endangered species. Okay. Okay, as what I have said, um, um, the learning process or learning as a behavioral process can be linked, uh, can link behavioral ecology to evolution, natural selection, and of course, the different behaviors as it is being passed on from generation to generation has something to do with its genetic component. So biologists study the way both genes and the environment honed a particular behavior of an animal. So it's both genes and the environment, just like of our discussion with um, natural selection. So influences um, or behavior is influence the development of behavioral phenotypes, which is part of or, or can be rooted to the genetic material of the organism. Okay, so in this case, behavior that is developmentally fixed can be called as also as the innate behavior of the animal. Okay, so innate behavior, which is under strongly influenced by its genetic information. So the innate behavior and the developmentally fixed behavior is influenced primarily of its genetic material, the genetic material of the organism. Okay, so um, in terms of behavior also, we have what we saw called directed movements. Okay, so directed movements, so many animals move are under substantial genetic influence. So these are what we saw called um, directed movements. So for example, if you have um, escaping from a predator, so, the movement of the animal is away from the predator. And of course, this part, the movement of this particular predator is towards its prey for uh, food or the source of food. So, this is what we so called um, directed movements. Okay? So, they already knew which is the prey and which is already the predator. So, how to escape and how to catch its um, prey. So, moving away and moving towards, so this is an, a, a, one of the examples of directed movements, which is already influenced by the genetic material of the predator and, of course, the prey. Okay. So, we have also a uh, part of the directed movements, okay, which is related to um, the influence of genetics in behavior. We have what we so-called kinesis. Okay, as simple change in activity or turning weight in response to stimulus. Okay, for example, we have kinesis increase the chance that a soap bug will encounter and stay in a moist environment. So, it will follow uh, this particular bug. For example, will follow. Okay, follow a particular pattern. Okay, this pattern may not be fixed depending on the situation. Okay, so in an open dry area, kasi, it is noted that this particular bug becomes very active. Okay, so with that particular activity, it creates pattern, pattern towards a dry environment. And when the time comes that it detects a particular shade or moist sites, primarily it can be a leaf litter 
or a clump of grasses. So this particular moist site will actually make this particular bug less inactive, especially in very humid areas. So that is an example of kinesis. So changing the activity changing the activity depending on the stimulus. So kung nasa, for example, kung nasa um, dry environment siya, it becomes active. And pag nasa moist environment siya, it becomes less active. So that is kinesis. We have also what we saw called taxis. So it's a more or less automatic oriented movement toward or away from stimulus. For example, this fish the movement of the fish, if we have the direction of the river going to the, the, the that way, so the fish is moving against the flow or current of the river. So this is a best example where many uh, stream fishes uh, do this particular activity. We have the rheotaxis, wherein they automatically swim in an upstream direction. Um, if you notice, there are documentaries which shows how um, migration of salmon from the saltwater ecosystem towards the freshwater ecosystem, they actually do that. Okay? They actually fight the current of the stream. They move against um, the stream or the, the um, what we saw called against the current of bodies of water. Um, in relation also for um, taxis, meron tayong tinatawag na chemotaxis. Um, um, in some other references, ginagamit ito on microbiology or microorganisms. The movement of, of organisms both can be towards or away from that particular chemical. Okay. So that is taxis. Okay. So this particular um, movement is already um, within the genetic material of this organism. Okay. Another directed movement we commonly observe or commonly uh, know is actually migration. However, this particular process is, um, covers a long uh, distance movement of individual animals, usually on seasonal basis. So they t tend to transfer in a large or the whole population itself from one area to another, um, uh, especially um, if there is a change in season from winter. Okay, So to escape winter, they go down to the equator. And of course, after winter, they go back to it. So there's a large population of species that is being migrated. Uh, or large population of species that are migrating. Okay, so this is part already of the genetic material of the organisms. They tend to migrate because they tend to um, respond to the stimulus of the season or the climatic changes in the environment. Okay, so these are some of the examples where I can insert plants. You have directed movements also. So in plants, we have what we saw called trapeziums. So in, in trapeziums, this is actually the movement of plant or plant parts towards the source of the stimulus. Okay, for example, you have geotropism, the movement of um, the roots towards the source of the gravity. Actu actually, another type of tropism is actually hydrotropism with the movement of roots also. Uh, not towards the source of the gravity, but towards the source of water for its survival. You have tigmotropism, so for example, the tendril tend to uh, locate the location of um, hard objects where they can actually cling and to have additional support. And of course, you have phototropism, the movement of plant parts uh, towards the source of light. Okay, So this is already observable. And you have learned this one in your botany. Okay. So we have also nastic movement in plants. The nastic movements, the man, it doesn't follow, or the movement doesn't follow the source of the stimulus. For example, if you have this mirabilis halapa or the four o'clock plant, so after four o'clock, magko close na yung flower niya. So regardless of the direction of of light, basta papunta na siya doon sa uh, pahapon or paggabi, it already closes its flower. 
you have also Thigmo, uh, Thigmo Nasty for for Makahiya. So, hindi niya sinu- yung movement niya, hindi niya sinusundan yung source ng stimulus or yung touch. Ito naman, itong sa Venus Flytrap. So, there are three hairs inside its its leaves. It's actually modified leaf. So, when it is being touched, it automatic, automatically closes. Sa tulip naman, if there is change in temperature, okay, so they tend to open due to the changes in temperature, irregardless of the source of the change or source of temperature variation. Okay, so aside from directed movements, animals, uh, there are certain animal behavior where they can actually make signals and of course communicate. So a signal is a behavior that causes a change on another animal's behavior. So they to have a unique response to each other or particular species have a unique sound or signal type in which they communicate. So communication is the reception and response to signals. For example, in this figure, if the signal is being sent by the sender, it can be received only by... Uh, the target species or species of the same kind or the same or or individuals of the same species. So if this receives the signal, then it responds or to have decision. Other non-target species can receive the signal but do not respond. It is because they have also their own signaling mechanism or the process of communication. Still, animal signals and communication is part of or can be influenced by genetics. So, uh, animals communicate using visual, auditory, chemical, tactile, and electrical signals. So, the type of signal used to transmit information is closely related to animals' lifestyle and, of course, the environment. For example, in this aquarium of fishes. So, if there are particular um, compound or chemical being introduced to water, they tend to go down, okay? So, nagkukumpul sila sa ilalim. So, that is part of their uh, signaling mechanism that it's, there is something um, not good or there is an introduction of particular chemical in water. So, that is their um, um, signal na or, or parang communication nila na bababa sila on the lower level. Okay. So, auditory communication, yung mga maiingay na insects during night time. So, they have that unique um, sound, um, including also frogs, you know, toads, okay, and all other animals during night time or during rainy season. Okay, so, um, for frogs and toads, there are already what we so-called... Um, yung pagre-record ng kanilang sound which is being used now for identification. So, um, some of my colleagues um, and and friends are already using it in order to identify the species of frog. So, meron na silang... I forgot the term of that. I forgot the, the, the correct term. But uh, the using of animal sounds for its identification. So not only plants are also having signal, or not only animals have their own signaling mechanism, but also plants. So for example, in, in case of um, plants, plants do have a lot of um, bioactive metabolites where they secrete in order to protect its protect its self from pest infestation and of course pathogens. So, um, they try to, to el- emit uh, some of this, uh, the, this particular um, metabolite in gaseous form, which can be detected by animals and which uh, helps the plant protect itself, primarily because it is stationary and cannot move. So, this is a mechanism on how they signal these organisms okay, and protect itself. So, this emission of particular metabolites help or send signals to these organisms that they are or they contain um, uh, toxic compounds which can be um, uh, detrimental to this organism. So, upon 
um, receiving the signals through these uh, active metabolites, so they tend to move away from the plant. So that is one of the mechanism or signaling mechanism of the plant. So another type of signaling mechanism found in plants is the formation of root nodules, which is common to legumes. So plants in their roots tend to emit flavonoids, which can be used by rhizobia or nitrogen fixing bacteria which can send another signal to the plant to create now or to, to produce what we so-called nodules so that particular chemical is called as the nodulation factor so upon the reception of nodulation factor there is now a changes in the physiology of plant cells near within the roots forming now the extensions or changing its course of cell division, extending a particular root hair, coiling it down okay, together with the rhizobia. So this is now the association of the rhizobium and of course the root of the plant forming what we saw called root nodules. And of course you already knew what is the function of that particular association.